What's up, kiddos? Uh, as promised from yesterday, I'm going to do a little recording of an abbreviated version of the Congo lecture just to kind of give you guys some context here. So uh, let me share screen here for you. All right. So kind of big picture, I think it's worth, before we kind of delve into the notes, looking at Africa here, kind of introing our topic for this unit, which is imperialism. So with imperialism, you know, think back to, you know, the British and how the British had colonies, the 13 colonies that made up North America, right? You had the British government kind of controlling the way that the colonies were run, the royal proclamations established the colonies, right? Uh, the British were the ones that basically controlled everything. Uh, so that's like one version of, of imperialism. Um, and kind of in that very dominating sense of like one foreign power completely controlling another, that's at its core what imperialism is. And there's no um, kind of better example globally uh, than what the great European powers of the day, France, Britain, Germany, Belgium, uh, will do to the continent of Africa. Okay? Um, and in particular, with, with all of Africa being colonized, the central location where all of this is going to start off, it's going to be this massive country right here near the equator in the heart of Africa, which is called the Congo. Now today, the Congo is what used to be this Belgian colony of the Congo is two different countries, the Republic of the Congo and the Democratic Re Republic of the Congo. But it's basically all made up of the watershed of where the Congo River flows. And it's in the Congo, this massive territory, which is about the size of the United States east of the Mississippi River, where this whole scramble for Africa, the carving up and domination of the African continent is going to occur. Okay, So that in mind, uh, let's hop over, take a look at our notes here. And these notes can be found on our um, daily lesson plan or hyperlink there. Let's go through here um, pretty pretty efficiently. So big idea, this is right from our textbook. Ignoring claims of African ethnic groups, kingdoms, and city-states, Europeans established colonies. Europeans embarked in a new phase of empire building that affected both Africa and the rest of the world. Okay. There's a term here uh, of what Europeans will refer to Africa prior to colonization. They call it the dark continent. And it's dark, not in the context of like the people's skin color there, uh, but dark more so in the sense of that Europeans didn't really know what was like in Africa. They, um, up to that point in time, had kind of only worried about sailing around the perimeter, whether, you know, in the 1500s, they were trying to go to the Spice Islands, right? They're trying to get, you know, spices, uh, whether you're like Da Gama or uh, Magellan, uh, Diaz, sailing around. So Africa kind of in the 1500s and 1600s is just some sort of large obstacle to go and get around. And then of course, when the slave trade starts, Europeans didn't have to explore the interior because European slave traders would just stop along the coastline and African allies of theirs would bring slaves to them or enslaved peoples to them. So there was really no necessary need for Europeans to go explore the interior. And even if they wanted to, um, African diseases and the African uh, uh, geography and hostile African tribes kept them out. So Africans uh, or Europeans didn't really know what was inside of Africa. So that's why they called it the dark continent. And that is going to pretty radically change in the later half of the 1800s, okay, starting like the late 1860s, early 1870s. And it's gonna all revolve around a figure We'll skip here, we'll come back to Heart of Darks in just a moment. A figure named Henry Morton Stanley, as our video is going to try to play there. All right. So um, Stanley is one of these kind of like unlikely figures of great import in history. Uh, he was uh, born in Ireland. He was an orphan. Um, he eventually will take sail and go to the United States. He fights in the American Civil War on the Confederate side, captured by the, captured by the Union, released. Um, really kind of like by late 20s, early 30s, like hasn't really done anything in his life. Um, but around that time, there's a big, big sensational news story. And that was the disappearance of one of the most beloved and renowned figures in, in British society, a guy named Dr. David Livingstone. And Livingstone is the most famous British explorer of Africa. And he had set out 
few months earlier in search of the source of the Nile River and goes missing. So Henry Morton Stanley gets it in his mind, even though he has no experience whatsoever, even though he has never been to Africa, uh, Henry Morton Stanley gets it in his mind that he's going to go and find Livingstone. So he convinces uh, the newspaper editor, one of the more influential newspapers in the United States called the New York Herald, to finance an expedition. Uh, he acquires the money with the idea being that he's going to write this exclusive story about the search for Livingstone. So long story short, short Stanley sets out um, kind of this gigantic needle in a haystack search about what happened to Livingstone. Is he still alive? Is he injured? Is he dead? Um, and Stanley eventually picks up the trail. And as the story goes, when eventually he does come upon this village and this very sickly uh, man comes out, it leads to one of the more famous exchanges in history, uh, which undoubtedly you've heard of before, of Dr. Livingstone, I presume. And here's Livingstone, here's Stanley. So Stanley, by finding Livingstone, becomes this overnight sensation. Like he's world renowned, super well, uh, uh, respected as like, now he's the great explorer of Africa. Livingstone, for what it's worth, he hangs around, he refuses to leave, he says he's got some more work to do, um, eventually will succumb a couple years later to those diseases, he's buried in Africa, and eventually the British government is able to um, disinter the body and have it shipped back to England, uh, where it is buried in Westminster Abbey. Uh, so if you ever go to London, go to Westminster Abbey, you'll see the tomb of David Livingstone there. But Stanley, he's now the man of the hour. This guy who was kind of a nobody finds Livingstone and now suddenly he's the sensation. And because of this, a, uh, a rather ambitious European monarch named Leopold II reaches out to Stanley because Leopold has kind of a, a special mission and a, a, a ambitions of his own as well. Uh, Leopold, it should be said, as a way to try to understand him, is that he is not a good guy of history. He, in fact, uh, is going to unleash uh, one of the darkest uh, and uh, most horrific chapters in world history by what he plans on doing in uh, the Congo. Well, Leopold reaches out to Stanley and he tells Stanley, you know, I have this idea of, of having someone and in, in charter an expedition to go and to chart the Congo River right, this wild, almost untamable river. Uh, the Congo River is massive. It is the fastest flowing river in the world. It is the deepest river in the world. And it had not been plotted out. So it was this big, vast blank space in the middle of Africa. But Stanley, having found Livingstone, is believed to be the man of the hour. So he's hired by Leopold to go and to try to chart out the river. So Stanley sets out. He sets out from East Africa, moving westward, links up with the Congo River. Uh, he shoots, he hacks his way through, he strikes some deals, sails down the river, kind of a harrowing journey in its own right, before eventually reaching the coast. And Leopold, having charted this river out and having hired someone to go do that, now will claim that all of the land that the Congo River touches, which again is this huge territory, belongs privately to Leopold. Leopold wanted to set up his own private colony. And through Stanley, he has now charted the river. And through Stanley now, he starts organizing this private company, this corporation, to start setting up infrastructure. So roads, railway lines, transport stations, harbor facilities, to go start acquiring the Congo's very valuable natural resources. So Stanley goes and he does that. And what Stanley then begins under the direction of Leopold, as I mentioned, is this horrible, horrible period of human history. Okay? In fact, one thing that's unavoidable when you learn about the Congo and the Leopold's Congo and the Belgian Congo is um, oftentimes always talked in the context of a very famous book that's written that's called Heart of Darkness by a British author named Joseph Conrad. Mm -hmm. And Conrad in his book um, was attempting to try to reveal in a literary medium um, what exactly went wrong in the Congo, okay? Um, one of the more telling quotes of it, we can see in this next screen, um, describes the river itself and the river almost like this kind of ancient mythological being. 
So um, Conrad Heart of Darkness writes, going up that river was like traveling back to the earliest beginnings of the world when vegetation rioted on the earth and the big trees were kings. An empty stream, a great silence, an impenetrable forest. The air was warm, thick, heavy, sluggish. There was no joy in the brilliance of sunshine. The long stretches of the waterway ran on, deserted, into the gloom of overshadowed distances. On silvery sandbanks, hippos and alligators sunned themselves side by side. The broadening waters flowed through a mob of wooded islands. You lost your way on that river as you would in a desert, and butted all day long against shoals, trying to find the channel till you thought yourself bewitched and cut off forever from everything you had ever known. But essentially, the synopsis of Heart of Darkness involves uh, the narrator, a guy named Marlowe, um, being sent on a mission by the company which you're presumed to believe is the corporation that Leopold had set up. And Marlowe's task is to sail up the Congo River deep into the heart of the Congo to try to find another company official named Kurtz who had gone missing. No one had heard from him. So Marlowe's job was to go find out what happened to Kurtz. And as Marlowe progresses farther and farther up the Congo, away from the coast, away from civilization, he enters into kind of this primordial wilderness right and as he gets farther and farther into this what's called the heart of darkness he starts to see people losing their humanity and you know one famous scene he comes across this french frigate the ship that's on the coast of the riverbank and just like firing away blasting its cannons into the vegetation and marlo's trying to figure out like what are they shooting at and they weren't shooting at anything the people on board the ship had just gotten so fearful that there were enemies lurking all around them that they were just blasting away at nothingness. Well, Marlow eventually, uh, by the end of the story, um, does come upon, upon Kurtz, uh, and what he finds horrifies him because Kurtz had lost his mind. You know, he's naked, he's wearing like bones around his neck, he has like native Congolese worshiping him, uh, and he had just completely become untethered from reality. And Marlowe tries to bring Kurtz back to civilization, try to redeem him, try to pull him out of the heart of darkness. But in doing so, um, Kurtz actually dies very quickly when he's trying to be saved. So it's this tale Conrad's trying to tell of this madness of the Congo. And essentially it's that madness that's gonna cause all these horrific things to occur. Um, if you're interested, there's, I, I have linked on this page here, the shortened Sparkness version of Heart of Darkness, if you're interested in the tale. Um, so worth checking out maybe if you are interested. All right, so let's go. Let's take exact, an exact look at what that madness is in the Congo. Well, the Congo was filled with a huge amount of natural resources. Okay? It's in fact one of the, in terms of natural resource wealth, one of the wealthiest countries on earth. It's a huge amount of things in the Congo that you, in fact, use in your everyday life. So like the technology in your computers, the precious metals in your phones, like those types of things are harvested and mined out of the Congo. Okay? Um, unfortunately, with the way the Congo is today, it's one of the failed states. So the people there are, are, in fact, some of the poorest people on earth. Um, but back in the 1870s, when Leopold is setting up this colony, um, amongst many of the natural resources, by far the most valuable was rubber and the need and the drive to collect rubber. Now this is natural rubber and you can see on the right hand screen or left hand image here um, what, how rubber is collected. So you have rubber trees, there are vines that grow in the trees and the vines they secrete this white sap and the sap when hardened turns eventually into rubber. So you can see kind of these collection baskets as the sap follows gravity down the tree, it oozes out and goes in these collection baskets. Well, the company that Leopold sets up wants to get this rubber because industrial revolution is going on back in Europe. You need rubber for things like tires and hoses and gaskets and things like that. So the company would go and they would send out these officials and the officials oftentimes would hire Congolese tribes to like act as their muscle, like their tough men. So like these are these accounts, like out of nowhere, like this, this group of company officials and like armed Congolese would approach some lone village. The villagers would be rounded up and they would be told like, you have to go now collect rubber for us. You have to reach a certain quota or a specific amount to fill in a specified amount of time. So let's say every month, every person at village would then need to go collect 
five, six pounds of rubber. If they did so, fine. They would often be paid, but like meaningless, like tiny trinkets that were value, which didn't mean anything or valueless. But if they didn't collect the rubber, then there would be an unleashing of severe punishments. Okay. You would have instances in the next few images, just be heads up there, not the nicest images in the world, um, but you have like, you know, shackled workers, like enslavement going on. Now, this is 70 years after the Atlantic slave trade is finished, but company officials enslaving Congolese workers. Um, this, this small whip was called the Chicot, and the Chicot was, was used as like a severe form of punishment for those that didn't meet their quota. And then inevitably what would wind up happening is that you would have the dismemberment of hands. And you could see these two young kids with their hands having been removed. And the ideas of the hand removal, which kind of runs antithetical to collecting things because you need your hands to collect things. The idea was is that you're striking terror in the hearts of the other people in that village so that they know what would happen to them if they had failed to collect enough rubber. So at its core, it's this idea of what terrorism is. You are using abject fear, terror, to force people to go and to do something, okay? Um, all of these things are going on. There are villages that are massacred. There are villages that are put to the torch, a huge, huge loss of human life. But people in the outside world didn't really know what was going on because Leopold didn't allow outsiders in. Only he was the one that would control the message. So only his company officials could come in. Back in Europe, Leopold was the only one that put forward newspaper reports. And he's saying and talking about all these wonderful things he's doing in the Congo. But slowly, the story starts to filter out. And the story filters out due in large part to missionaries, these two men on the outside are missionaries who made their way into the country okay, or into the, the private colony. Here you can see these missionaries with photographic evidence having the Congolese show like, listen, this, these hands, these severed hands, this is what's happening to us. This is what Leopold's company is doing. And missionaries, when they first started actually like writing letters out to say like, hey, listen, these horrible things are going on. Leopold like clamps down on that. He like says these guys are liars. And even people that did read the letters, they thought that it was so sensational. Like there's no way that these things are true. But then eventually when pictures start coming out, like that tells a completely different story. And perhaps uh, the most famous of the images is the one we'll see on the next slide here. Um, this in fact happened after Leopold left, but the Belgians took over. Here you can see a father staring at the severed hand and severed foot of his daughter, whose great crime it was, was to not fulfill her rubber quota. So this horrific drive for wealth, for greed, for power that Leopold and the Belgians after him led to this humanitarian crisis of untold proportions, right? This is the horror that was unleashed. This was, as Conrad's words were, the, the you know, inside the heart of darkness. Now, when news of this actually fully comes out, the world is stunned, they are horrified. Uh, Leopold is in fact forced to abdicate his throne, his son takes over. The Belgian government will then go and presume control of the colony and a lot of the same bad stuff still goes on. But most importantly, for the other European powers, let's say like Britain and France, okay, and Germany gets involved too, the Portuguese, um, they don't learn the right lesson from the Congo. The lesson from the Congo is you don't treat people this way, right? There's no cost on earth whatsoever, no matter what the natural resources is, to go and to treat people like this. And Leopold, when all said and done, will cause millions and millions and millions and millions of people to die from his choices, okay? The European powers, uh, the lesson that they unfortunately learn is that oh, this blank spot on the map, this, this dark continent of Africa, there's the potential for great, great wealth inside of it, right? That they can go and that they can try to find all these natural resources to try to uh, and, you know, enrich their own societies. 
you know, because Leopold, a lot of money that they were taking out of the Congo, it's going back and, and building and aggrandizing a place like Brussels in Belgium. Like a lot of the buildings in Brussels are all funded through the blood and through the deaths of millions of Congolese, right? So Europeans, the other great European powers, they, they kind of look at Leopold's example and they're like, oh, he did horrible things, but we can go make a lot of money. So what sets off in motion right after Leopold, you know, controls the Congo and the story that we will take a look at starting on Monday is what sets off what's called the scramble for Africa, which culminates in this big meeting called the Berlin Conference. And that's our topic. And the story of that is, is in part on Monday. Okay. So the Congo, this very, very awful chapter in human history. Okay, so uh, we will continue our tale, we'll continue our information on imperialism and in Africa um, on Monday. All right, so we will stop and I'll see you guys then.